Good morning. How's everybody doing today? I don't, you don't sound convincing. <laughs> hey, I just, uh, I did want to bring you up to speed. A number of you have been praying for the Corvelli family. And uh, Amy, who six weeks ago was taken into the hospital with some symptoms that wound up being very serious and uh, stage four cancer. And uh, two o'clock Saturday morning, uh, Amy is no longer struggling with any pain or discomfort, and she's in the presence of the Lord. And so life got a lot better for her, but a lot harder for everyone who loved her. And so we're just asking um, prayer for her family. Uh, Rita, she has eight siblings, and uh, so they are going to be processing a lot of decisions and responsibilities over the next few days. I'd just like us to take a moment and lift them in prayer as we head into this today. Uh, Father, um, we've all known moments of loss and sorrow, and it, it's in those moments that we discover the greatest truth, and that's you never leave us, that you find a way to surround us with your presence and comfort our hearts and give us enough strength and energy to get through the demands of each day. So we're confident in asking that you would do that for Amy's family today. We ask that uh, even as they make plans and as they process the decisions, that uh, you would give them an efficiency about that, and that even by the time we get to the service, that you'll already be prompting their hearts and their minds with some really joyous memories of times that they've had together. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll try one more time. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the early service said, I came to church in the dark. <laughs> I don't like coming to church in the dark. I wasn't sure whether it was she didn't like coming to church or she didn't like the dark or both. And um, so I had one person tell me if God intended me to see the sunrise, he would make it happen later in the day. <laughs> and now it's happening later in the day. So that's how that works. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to touch base with you uh, real quick on this morning. And uh, the first is this. All through this week, we've been, or this month, we've been acknowledging this truth. And I'd like us to say this, to declare this out loud and together, all right? With God, there is always a next. It is one of the most true, grace-filled things we can ever learn about God. That we haven't crossed some invisible line where he doesn't have any use for us any longer or we're somehow disqualified from his purpose, that he actually has a future for us. I think that's a really big deal. Um, you know that we're in a capital campaign, and uh, I hope that you know that uh, next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. There's some information I just wanted to bring you up to speed about first, and the first thing is this. Our church leadership over the last couple of years, in addition uh, to uh, fully funding all of our ministries, has been able to set aside to help with this project uh, $500,000. So we've already started the project with a mi half a million dollars uh, ready to go. How many are very grateful we're not starting from scratch? But yeah, that's really good news. We also asked our elders and our staff to get their commitments in early because we believe that we lead by example, not just telling others what to do, but showing them how we're learning to walk in these things as well. And there were a few of you also that got your commitments in early. So what I'd like you to know is that we have received 38 commitments for a total so far of $382,362. I think that's worth a pretty good <laughs> applause. That is unbelievable. Which means we are already over 38% of our goal. And I think that that is a significant thing. What I do want you to know is that next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. And in fact, if you just reached out, if you didn't bring it with you, there's one in the bottom of the chair in front of you. It's a, a, a Next magazine. And we've been uh, processing uh, devotionals. In fact, this week we're kind of focusing on special ministries in our church and uh, we're processing devotionals. But what I'd like you to do is look all the way to page 52 and uh, what you will see is that that's an example of our commitment card. We've had a few questions, so I just want to walk through so there's no confusion on this. Obviously, there's a place for your contact information. And uh, commitment cards were mailed to you. In addition to that, there's extra ones in the seat, and we'll have more next Sunday. So 
uh, don't, don't worry if you don't have your card in your hand right now. This is just a, a, a picture of it. And then there are some people who say, well, I would like to give a one-time gift. You can certainly do that. Others have said, well, I'd like to give something incrementally over the next 36 months. Also an option. In fact, there may be other time frames that work better for you, and we're completely flexible with that. Some people want to give something on the front end and then something um, incrementally over time. All of those options are available to you. And so what we encourage you to do is, is as you sort that out, just um, total that up because next Sunday when you bring your commitment card, uh, we will gather and, and determine what our total commitment as a church family is. Now, I think you know this is a three and a half million dollar project that we're looking at. We already have a half a million dollars in the bank. We have over 300, almost uh, uh, $390,000 that has, has come in. And so I believe that God is going to help us achieve our goal of what was at least a million dollars so that we can move this project forward and see what God can do in it. So that would be a really good place for an amen. What do you think? Amen. All right. So this morning we are in Joshua chapter 1. And uh, if you know the story about Joshua, they actually were in the process of, of moving out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And we're going to look at a couple of very interesting passages of Scripture today. It says Joshua ordered the officers of the people Go through the camp, tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here and go in to take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua gave some different commands. In case you don't know, on that side of the Jordan, they liked that area so well that they asked Moses if they could have that property. And Moses told them that they could. And so these folks are not going to be possessing any land on the west side of the Jordan. But this is what Joshua says to them. Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives, your children, your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you, and until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. And then a couple of verses over in chapter 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits, in case you're wondering how far that is. It's about 10 football fields long. Between you and the ark, do not go near it. Joshua told the people, and let's all read the remainder of this verse out loud and together. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. It's a great passage of scripture. Joshua gave some directions. They are as follows. Get your provisions ready. Move in three days. You are to help others in the process. Follow the Ark of the Covenant when it moves and keep a distance of about 10 football fields. Now, Bible scholars say that there was in excess of 1 million people who made up the Israelite community and some people think it may have been as high as 2 million people. So they're going to move 2 million people in three days. Now just think, if you had to move, just you and your family in three days, how would you be feeling about that? See, this is a challenging passage, and we don't really recognize what a, what a challenge it would have been for them and what it is for us, because they're being given some specific directions. You're going to move your tent, your family, your food, your possessions. Everything's going to move. Three days. And people struggle with that kind of direction in their lives. 
No one likes being told what to do. We have learned in our culture to define freedom as being able to come up with and call all the shots in our lives. And so the nation of Israel is being challenged on this point. And by the way, God will challenge us on that point too. If freedom means calling all the shots, then if the direction comes from anyone else, we will feel we are no longer free. That could be a challenge for us. It's based on a simple misunderstanding of what freedom is. And if we want to get to the next thing that God has for our lives, this is one of the truths that we're going to have to come to terms with, and that is experiencing God's best happens on God's terms. Experiencing God's best happens on God's terms. See, we like the idea of what God wants to bless us with and what he wants to provide us, but often we struggle with the timing of it. So there are things that we would consider doing, but this is not a good time. And so whether it's a timing issue or a priority issue, we prefer to stay in control. But what God's word tells us is, is that if we are in control of all of the direction of our lives, we have a very hard time finding God's best for our lives. The second thing about experiencing God's best is that it flows out of a commitment to help others. That the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan actually had to walk across the Jordan with their fellow Israelites and help them. Even though they were not going to have any residence in that part of the country, they were very satisfied with where they were, and it was a good land, but they were, they were needed to help someone else. You know, one of the greatest influence, I'll take that back, the greatest influence in human history is Jesus Christ. And what's fascinating is, is that he never insisted on his own timing or his own priority. He was constantly seeking the will of his Father to find out what he should do and when he should do it. And he was constantly willing to serve others. And because he did that, 2,000 years later, it's hard to find anyone who doesn't know something about his life. This is what he said in Matthew, the 20th chapter. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He would say this in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And yet we see Jesus fully living out God's intended purpose in and through his life. And the result is, is that many have experienced the grace of God for themselves in every generation since then. The primary difference between using people and serving people has to do with how we use our time and how we establish our priorities. And the simple truth is, if I only do what is convenient for me, it is very hard to serve others. If I only act in a time that I prefer, it's very hard to serve others. If I insist on my timing and my priorities, the tendency will be to use others for my benefit. But Jesus shows us the exact opposite and what an incredible impact he had in our world. God surprises us by showing that when we submit to his timing and his priorities, we actually experience our highest levels of fulfillment and our deepest meaning, that that's where we discover it. Now, the word submit is kind of a bad word in our culture, and no one likes to think of themselves as being submitted or submissive. If you watch any of the mixed martial art fighting, not only do they punch and kick each other, but they will put you in holds that will rip your limbs from your body unless you do something which is called tapping out. And you just tap like that, and then the other person has to let you go. That's the rule. But here's the thing. What you're saying is, I completely submit and I surrender. And we don't like that concept. And so people often think that that's what submission is. When the Bible talks about submission, it's talking about coming under the domination of someone else, completely surrendering, tapping out. They've won. We've lost. That's a picture of submission. And what God wants us to know is that has nothing to do with submission. 
That's a different thing. That's subjugation. When you are dominated by someone else, that's subjugation. Submission is a very different thing. Now, if you've been around religious environments very long, you've probably heard horror stories of some cult who had some charismatic leader who dominated the personalities and the individualities of people in their group. And those stories never end well. The people who, who participate often don't survive, and the ones that do carry wounds with them for the rest of their lives that create nightmares and make it very difficult for them to ever reintegrate in a healthy way into society. And there are people go, that's the problem with submission. That's not submission. That's subjugation. Real submission has nothing to do with a loss of identity or a loss of personality or passive or mindless responses. In fact, biblical submission actually does not require you to diminish any of those things, but enhances your identity and your abilities and celebrates your personality. How many wouldn't mind being celebrated every once in a while? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? So, there are some people also who want to avoid all responsibility in their lives, so they use the term submission. So they'll do something like this. Let's say, let's say you want to buy a house, and, and there are, it's you and your spouse, so we're, we're going to buy a house, and, and, your, and your spouse goes, well, I'll just submit to whatever you want. Oh, okay. It could be submission, or it could be that your spouse doesn't want any responsibility if you buy a bad house. <laughs> so when you find out all this horror stuff about mold in the basements and rats in the walls and the electrical wiring not working and the house is about to be condemned and it's going to cost a gazillion dollars to fix it, the person goes, I just submitted. I, that was not my idea. I had nothing to do with that. We, we don't even need that big a thing. Sometimes just picking a restaurant Oh, whatever you want. Sounds like they're easy to get along with. They just don't want to be responsible for a bad meal. See? That's not submission either. Submission is not about reducing my personality, my individuality. It's not about being subjugated or dominated by someone else. It's not about avoiding responsibility. Biblical submission is a very different thing. And that's why these passages in Scripture are so vital to us. Biblical submission, first of all, is acknowledging authority. <laughs> acknowledging authority. So, let's just check. How many of you, if you are coming upon a stop sign, will at least significantly slow down? <laughs> How many, if you see a red light, you will actually try to stop? I know some of you, I've seen you on a yellow light, you actually accelerate. <laughs> That's not what that light means. But at least for the red one, how many, if you were driving down the road and suddenly you discovered that there's a police officer behind you and his lights are going and his siren is blaring, you would actually pull over? How many would do that? Because if you don't, then they start flying helicopters over your car and, and, and showing live feed about this person who refuses to pull over. It doesn't look so good and it doesn't end so well. Why do we stop at signs and lights and pull over when a police officer flashes his lights? And the reason is because there's real authority. And if we don't do those things, then we can complicate our lives in ways we don't need them to be complicated. <laughs> Jesus operated with astonishing authority. And some people think that he just kind of generated that himself. He told us what the secret of his authority was. He said, I actually don't generate any authority myself. I submit to authority, and because I submit to authority, it flows freely through me. He was completely submitted to his father. That means the authority of his father flowed through his life very powerfully. He, he could command even weather and demonic spirits. It's astonishing how much authority he had. He wasn't just bossy. There's a difference between bossy and authority. He had authority. As a pastor, I am under authority. I'm under the authority of our church council. I'm under the authority of the denomination that I'm a part of. Because I think that if a person just operates without being under authority, the only authority they have left is the authority they can generate on their own. And that rarely goes well. We need authority in our lives. So the question I would have for you is, who has the right to speak into your life? 
Who has the right to bring something up that you would seriously consider and give attention to? And if the answer is you don't have anyone, then you're operating on the authority that you can manufacture. And you should know there's going to come a point in your life you will be very disappointed by the lack of authority that you have. There's another thing that biblical submission is, and that is caring for others. Biblical submission is caring for others. So if let's just check. Any people in the room have had any experience being a parent? Let's just, okay. Remember when you brought that, that beautiful little baby home? What a joyous day that turned into a night of great sorrow, fatigue, exhaustion. <laughs> because the little baby doesn't sleep on your schedule. The little baby decides that it's, it's hungry, 2 o'clock in the morning, and it makes a noise. And what do the parents do? The parents do not knock on the, on the wall. Little baby. We do not eat at 2 in the morning. <laughs> Breakfast will be at 7. Try to keep it down. No, no. That will not work. If you tried it, you know that. Right? And it's not just that. Little babies also don't seem to have a discernible schedule for when they fill their diapers. <laughs> just whenever they feel like it. And you don't get to say, little baby, if you could just wait until the morning. No, no, no. That little baby makes some kind of, of crying noise, which there is no technology in the world that is able to silence. You can, you can go ahead and buy the noise-canceling headphones. It won't work. I know. I won't tell you how I know. So, so there it is. So now you're, you're just... And parents, parents, getting up 2 o'clock in the morning, staggering from exhaustion, going in, changing dirty diapers, heating up formula or bottles, feeding the little baby. What are you doing? You're submitting to the needs of the baby. Why? Because you love the baby. You care for the baby. You want what's best for the baby. The thought that the baby would, would be suffering in any way is unacceptable to you. And so you submit to the needs of children. And, and here's the thing. I know new parents think, oh, I'll be so glad when they're potty trained. All of this will be over. <laughs> well, that may be over, but there are other things. Turns out there's this ongoing kind of submission to the needs of children as they get older so that they can navigate life as an adult who understand how the world actually works. We submit even to the weather. If it gets cold, we change the way we dress. If it snows hard enough, we stay home. It's amazing how many things we submit to in our life. And so we have to learn that not only do we submit to authority in our life so that our life is not unnecessarily complicated, we also submit to the care of others in our life because we actually want what's best for them. There are people who will come in and they'll, they'll visit our church family. And people come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some people have, have never been in a church. And we had a person who, who came to our, our, our family fun day, and they were very confused about our church service. They said, this is how they described it to us afterwards. They started with a concert, and then there was this thing with the hot tub. I don't know what that was. And then a guy kind of gave a lesson, and then they fed us. Well, if you think about it, if you've never been around religious environments, you wouldn't know. By the way, in case you don't know, the hot tub was a water baptism. Well, it's not actually a hot tub. <laughs> so, the, and there are people come in. This confuses There are people coming from different environments, maybe more liturgical or traditional or, or all different kinds of. And this is what some people will say. They'll come and they'll say, oh, pastor, I kind of like it here. If, if you could sing these kinds of songs, I would feel really at home. Or if you could deliver your message in, in this kind of way or in this kind of time frame. I actually had a person, I was doing a leadership thing at this last week, and a person said, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you could keep your answer brief. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I kept it very brief. So the question is, 
can I only worship in a room that meets all of my expectations and caters to all of my preferences? Because if I can only worship when everything's the way I want it, I wonder if it's worship anymore. It's amazing what I have learned being in environments that are different from my personal preferences. In fact, you might not know this, the music style that we have in our church family is not my personal preference. It's not my favorite kind of music. And I didn't become a pastor to get the church I always wanted. I became a pastor to be able to serve the church that God always wanted. That's what I would like to see. What does God want in Chi Lai? What does God want in Western New York? That's worth knowing. And so it would, be, it would not serve the congregation well at all if I just walked in here and said, well, I'm the pastor of the church, and this is the style of music, and this is how I'm going to preach, and, and if you don't like it, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Well, okay, D does that sound like any level of biblical submission? D does that sound like that God can use that? Does that sound like you're serving anyone, or is that self-serving? And so we have to learn how to serve others. We have to learn how to submit to something other than just our own personal preferences. So, uh, people are surprised uh, to discover that you can actually learn a lot when everything isn't catering to the way that you want it. Now, to go back to the timing issue, Paul gives us a great passage in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time I heard you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Now, would you say this phrase out loud and together with me? Ready? Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. It's astonishing how often God brings us to those moments, and he doesn't say in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, three years. Right now is the moment. Right now is the time. And it's amazing if we are willing to accept the direction of God in terms of timing and priority, how much of his will we can experience in our lives. Now today, I don't know if you realize this, but we're actually not going to conclude the service in this room. We're going to conclude the service outside unless it starts hailing and, and pouring like crazy. And there's a prayer that we're going to pray out there in just a moment. But just before we go outside, we will receive an offering now. And so that will allow us that when we're done out there, you won't have to come back here for anything other than if you're just cold and want to warm up a little bit. But you won't have to come back into this room. You'll just be able to go back into the lobby and, and wait for your children to be dismissed if you have kids in classrooms. Here's what I want you to, to think about just for a second before we receive the offering. How many were aware there was a mega lotto jackpot of $1.6 billion this last week? How many did know that? Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I, I've been around long enough to know that there are some people in this room who went and bought a ticket and told God, if I win, the church won't have to raise any money for this edition. I'm not going to ask if that was you, but I know there's people like that in the room. Personally, I told God if he would give me the numbers, I would make him proud. <laughs> Didn't even get a single number, not one, nothing. And so, why is that? Because that's not how God does things. By the way, one person in South Carolina won $1.6 billion. <laughs> that's a, it's amazing. So, so why doesn't God just do that for us? Because, because it's not how God works. As it turns out, we don't grow and develop to our potential if everything is just given to us when we want it. That it's as we learn to submit to the timing of God and the priority of God that he develops us into strong sons and daughters of God. And that's his real goal. So uh, I'm going to pray for our offering while it's being received. You're going to hear some people have some pretty candid conversation about how they've thought about giving and sacrificial giving in their own lives. Father, thank you. Of course, there's a part of us that would like this to be easier, but you are committed to growing us to become the sons and daughters that you destined us to be. Would you help us learn to submit to your timing, to submit to your priorities? In Jesus' name, amen.